down the ages past, Allah sent his messengers to deliver humankind from darkness to light. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preachings and argue with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. That's also the ongoing mission of Islamic Research Foundation or IRF, spreading the truth of Allah's final message to mankind. Founded in 1991, IRF today offers some of the best services and facilities in the world for presenting an understanding of Islam in an objective and scientific way. Its programs are primarily focused on correcting misconceptions and promoting understanding of Islam. IRF also imparts Dawah training to Dais to aptly convey the message of Islam. IRF has one of the most modern studios producing programs presenting Islam, which are beamed regularly on many international TV channels in over 150 countries. Dr. Zakir Naik, President of IRF, reaching out across countries worldwide, from America to Europe to Africa to Asia to Australia, strives to clarify Islamic viewpoints. He dispels the many media myths and anti-Islamic prejudices propagated the world over by anti-Islamic forces. Dr. Zakir Naik is a medical doctor. He is acclaimed the world over for his spontaneous and convincing replies to questions posed by critics and skeptics during the question and answer sessions after his talks. He is also renowned for his verbatim quotes with references from major religious scriptures of the world. Dr. Zakir and other faculty of the IRF train many Dais in effective Dawah techniques. IRF's website provides free Dawah training material for you to download and become an effective Dai yourself. Dr. Zakir Naik's talks are available on audio and video, cassettes, CDs and DVDs the world over. IRF today is creating a change in the hearts and minds of millions of Muslims and non-Muslims worldwide towards a proper understanding and respect for Islam. Have a question or doubt about Islam and its teachings? Now you know, one of the best resource centers to get convincing answers from is Islamic Research Foundation. 5658 Tandil Street, North Dongri, Mumbai, 400009, India. Phone 2373-6875. Fax 9122-2373-0689. Email islam at the rate of irf.net. For more information, log on to our website www.irf.net. Inshallah, the program is going to begin now with the Qirat from the Holy Quran. A few verses will be read by Brother Fahim. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir rahmanir rahim من أجل ذلك كتبنا على بني إسرائيل 
أنه من قتل نفسا بغير نفس أنه من قتل نفسا بغير نفس أو فساد في الأرض أو فساد في الأرض فكأنما قتل الناس جميعا ومن أحياها فكأنما أحيا الناس جميعا ولقد جاءتهم رسلنا بالبينات ثم إن كثيرا منهم بعد ذلك في الأرض لمسرفون Here is the meaning of the verses just recited. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful. Because of that, we ordained for the children of Israel that if anyone killed a person not in retaliation or murder or to spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he killed all mankind. And if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of all mankind. And indeed, they came to them, our messengers, with clear proofs, evidences, and signs. Even then, after that, many of them continued to exceed the limits set by Allah. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, was salatu was salam, ala Rasulillah. وعلى عليه وصحابي أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه خولي Respected Chief Guests August Audience I welcome all of you with the Islamic greeting Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of us. It gives me immense pleasure in welcoming all of you on behalf of Islamic Information Center for the unique communal harmony meet. It has been a long felt need by the people of Chennai to have a meet of this kind cutting across religions and differences. I'm sure, inshallah, by the will of Almighty that this meet would enable to understand similarities between us which would promote communal harmony. I welcome with gratitude the Chief Speaker of the day, Dr. Zakir Naik, the Chief Guest of the program. All the ladies and gentlemen present here, all the organizers and volunteers who have been the backbone of the meet. May Almighty pave the way for us to walk on the straight path and may He guide us to gain benefit out of this meet, Ameen. Waqiru dawana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Respected dignitaries or the dais, of the dais, my dear brothers and sisters, it gives me immense pleasure to be amidst you in this August gathering in this sweet evening. It, I feel this as a golden opportunity to express my views on terrorism in the present day world scenario. Evolution is nature's way of showing concern for the survival of all living beings. If we observe carefully, we can see that the nature loves everything it has created. It has given color and shape to even the smallest of its creatures. We cannot, but we have potentialities of being creative when we are born from so great a creator. If we are not happy now, we will never be. We can no longer lose in life. 
once we have gained the ability to see the greatness in god in war we do not eat whom we kill lest it should be considered barbarous it is better to be harmless than helpful when god has given us sight to see his greatness surely he must have also given us a mind to understand it sight helps us to realize the existence of god but only the mind can help us to find him deep down below the jumble of our minds there is something which knows and which can reveal much knowledge and wisdom we are in big society following different paths of life and connected with different religions when we accept society we commit ourselves to a ridiculous way of life the greatest achievement of all is conquest of self for every human being that should be the goal and that is the only great achievement strange that our basic instincts should be the same as those of other living creatures can the thoughts and philosophy of a person go beyond his pursuits my dear brothers to love the creator we must first love his creation man in his glamour and glory forgets the glamour and glory of god one thing unique about wisdom it cannot be inherited but must be acquired man's success should not be judged by the wealth of his possession what he has but to the extent whether he is at peace with himself the success of our achievement depends on the intensity of our desire wisdom lies in its choice as far as the soul within us in everybody we have soul the energy which understands and speaks and whichever har vice and virtue are understood it is the soul so as far as the soul is concerned it understands only the language of feeling each unfortunate event in life should be considered as a lesson for the development of our minds our attitudes govern our destiny therefore the happiness that we enjoyed in childhood was due to our state of mind not due to any external factor we must realize that we have become victims of our own values in everybody among us one of the chief vices which could destroy the intellect is the vice of anger therefore a person desirous of remaining a true human being must conquer anger in all possible ways anger is an acid that does more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to the person on whom it is poured the whole nervous system in our body is shattered by an outburst of anger and various poisons are thrown into the blood when one is angry that's why it is absolutely necessary for a person to conquer anger from anger delusion arises and from delusion bewilderment of memory when memory is bewildered intelligence is lost and when intelligence is lost one falls down again into the material fall material pool hence anger has to be controlled the best tool to conquer anger is forgiveness it is said that by remembering an injury or insult done to us and not by forgiving the wrong doers we keep our wounds ever green hence the best remedy in the interest of our own spiritual mental and physical health 
is to forgive the wrong doers there are only two things which concern us mind and matter our conscience is the best guru only our feelings can bring about self realization we should be guided by our feelings not by our thoughts the richness of life comes with feelings that which cannot be seen it can be felt the greatest pilgrimage is the journey of ours is inward by looking inward we can travel to any part of the universe the inward journey begins from the time we start to observe our mind body and behavior love is the common language of all our creatures only our ignorance prevents us from experience experiencing the love it is love which permeates the atmosphere world and universe we cannot experience love without a feeling of oneness we should try to convert our adversities into opportunities we have the intelligence to make weapons but not the wisdom to refrain from using them some nations for which people have fought and died no longer exist only those who identify with you are close all others are strangers even though they may be related the younger generation are merely repeating our mistakes ceremonious blessings can never be effective as we are responsible for our own deeds acts and behavior our motives determine our destiny our selfish motives eventually lead us to misery and destruction whereas our unselfish motives eventually lead us to bliss and immortality brothers the present age is extremely difficult to live in the teaching of self restraint can be effective first self control and then discipline the walls of casteism and communalism divide the people to make such walls transparent we should realize and make a slogan man is first a man is a hindu or a muslim in short we should realize that we are all one problems are multiplying they prop up in ever new forms the problems would not be solved as long as the prevalent trends of our age do not change their course therefore the trend would change by observing only each individual self restraint it should be truly a historical day for mankind when religion and science complement each other that would be the day when devotion to self restraint would have served its purpose and it would be possible to train man to lead a proper life why pani kodutha in the islamic information center avarku pani ude nandri kuri enude ore mudithu kolugire nandri vanakkam in the name of allah the kindest and the most merciful one the dignitaries seated in the dais the dignitaries seated in the audience ladies and gentlemen at the outset i should uh, thank madam fatima muzaffar janab muzaffar ahmed my brother janab hakim for giving me this opportunity to address the allied audience i am feel very humbled in front of uh, great scholars like richard haynes chordia and uh, the erudite scholar dr zakir naik from whom you are going to listen about the terrorism and jihad terrorism is an aberration in the human behavior terrorist whether it is hindu fundamentalist or it is christian terrorist or it is muslim terrorist they have abnormal brain they have delusion and illusion and the way in which the terrorism has to be tackled is these people have to be counseled by the fellow human beings and the administrators have to find out what exactly is the root of root cause of the terrorism and see that the root cause is completely eliminated the terrorist or in the pawn but what exactly is the cause is the one which has to be found out and they are also fellow human beings the jihad what is jihad is a struggle you struggle to earn more and give charity you struggle 
more and more to help the fellow human beings, to feed the poor, to look after the downtrodden, to heal the sick and the suffering. The struggle is not to take away life. The struggle is to, to help life to thrive well in a happy mood. I am a practicing physician and a consultant nephrologist for over four decades. 40 years in this profession, fighting illness with hope and optimism has only reinforced one important fact of life, that life is very precious. Every life is a precious gift to be respected and treated with care. Today, life exists even after death. A dead man can save 11 lives with his two kidneys, two eyes, two lungs, one heart, one liver, one pancreas, provided the organs are harvested in time. Of course, the soul is indestructible, that there is always a chance that when a person dies, he goes home. He doesn't die. He lives, he goes and lives in his home. Living is possible only if we learn to live in harmony, learning to care for our fellow human being, expressing our respect and kindness. It is in each human being that the unmanifest God manifests himself. The godliness in man is manifested in his unselfish ability to give, give food for the hungry, give books to the poor for education, give medicine for the sick, give love to the needy, and neglected young or old ones, give a smile of hope to the depressed and deprived. Love is the law of life. Where there is love, there is a touch of divine. Where there is hatred, there is a devil in that particular individual. He has to be counseled. And isn't that what religion is all about? To be good and too good. The secret of religion lies not in theories, but in practice. The basic aim of religion is to bring peace to man. Mahatma Gandhi regarded nonviolence as his religion. Today, it is very, very important that we follow the principles of the father of the nation. Everyone must be happy here and now. The book from which to learn religion is our own mind and heart. We have to remember it is feeling that is life, strength and vitality. You must have muscles of iron, nerves of steel. Feel like Christ, you'll be Christ. Feel like Buddha and you'll be Buddha. Religion is the manifestation of the natural strength that is in man. Man's strength or his tolerance, love, unselfishness, generosity, truthfulness, and combined with faith. Differences create gaps, and we need to reap love, not hatred out of diversity. And to do so, we need to release the long forgotten value of our tolerance. To recapitulate Mahatma Gandhi, quote, if you take away one eye for eye, the whole world will become blind. Also, he said, if only Christians are true Christians and follow the principles of Christianity, there will not be one Hindu in India. So the basic principles of human life is more important than the religion and other unimportant matters. So let us teach ourselves to sow so, so love where there is hatred, to pardon where there is injury. Our brother said, forgive. I think there is the great ideals of humanism is forgiveness. To spread faith where there is doubt. Give hope where there is despair. And to love to be loved so that our country wakes into that heaven of freedom where the world has not been broken into fragments by narrow dimension walls fulfilling Tagore's dream. I would like to end by saying that if man is not able to respect the manifested God in human being, what is the use of thinking about the unmanifested God? I think we have to respect God, man. We have to see that we give love. We are pure. We are truthful. We have uh, the charitable attitude. And we save people rather than taking lives. With this, I, end, I thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you. Salam alaikum. 
Freedom of religion is a central value in the U.S. There's a common belief that Americans don't care about religion. I'm here to tell you that is wrong. Americans care passionately about religion. For us, however, religion is perhaps more of a private than a public matter. For us, it matters very much that one chooses one's own religion because, in the end, one chooses one's own fate and one's own salvation. I can look at my own family, for instance, and I'm not making this up, but within my own family, we have Methodist Christian, we have a Buddhist, we have a Jew, we have an Eastern Orthodox Catholic, we have a Shia Muslim, and we finally have a Roman Catholic. And that's just my family. And I submit that most American families will have in them a variety of individuals with a variety of views, nearly all of whom carry very passionately about their religion. Now, I love India. I've been coming to India for more than 30 years. I would guess that the most of you were not born when I first came to India. So I'm the old, the old experienced teacher here, and I tell you that India is changing very, very rapidly, and it's an exciting time to be here in India. India is, along with the U.S., I think the two most pluralist societies there are in the world. I run into Indians constantly who say, well, I'm here, but I'm actually from Calcutta. And I'm there, but my family is actually from Kerala. Again and again and again. An Indian is not a person who's rooted in a single place, but comes from a family, a family that can look back to other parts of India, to other ways of seeing things. And so you too, like an American, have made choices to determine who you are and why you are here. That, to me, is very exciting. I find that as I visit India again and again, all the way from Ladakh, Srinagar, to Chennai, that it is not a divide between those who care about religion and those who don't care about religion. It's a divide between those who believe that people should be allowed to practice their religion and those who do not. The United States is known for Coca-Cola, Pepsi, MTV, a whole lot of other things which you may enjoy but which do not seem particularly important. But I would suggest that the United States gifts to the world are tolerance and freedom and the respect for tolerance and freedom. The United States wants a world where there's a balance of power between those who would be for this version of freedom and those who would be for that version of freedom. The United States does not want a world where the United States controls any approach to freedom. Instead, we want you and you and you to work with us to find a balance that will lead us all to freedom. Therefore, the United States wishes to create the conditions that will allow you and all the people in the world to choose along with you their own ways toward political and economic liberty. The United States supports this not out of a political purpose, not out of a desire to appear good, but because it is good. Now, the United States believes in peace. However, the United States also believes that it is necessary to defend peace. Especially, we wish to achieve our goals of freedom and tolerance by defending peace against those who advocate global terror. 
We will use every tool at our disposal to prevent and contain and respond to terrorist attacks. However, when I say every tool, I do not mean bombs, planes, guns, knives. I mean things like good education. I mean things like clean water, sanitation, health. I mean things like plain old auditing of financial accounts. I mean things like cooperating with your authorities, with those of the other countries in the world, to contain criminal elements. I mean things such as stopping the flow of narcotics, which fuels a lot of terrorism. I mean things such as stopping the flow of people against their will across borders to be used by others. These really are, I think, basic to our campaign against terror. It is unfortunate that too often the resort to force captures the central attention when actually you and I are engaged together with all these kinds of ways of combating terror. There's a common misperception that the U.S. somehow is against Islam. I am here to tell you that is absolutely, definitely, completely wrong. The U.S. is a nation of immigrants, and our people include Muslims from around the world, whether it be Bangladesh, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Africa, or of course, India. Therefore, the U.S. war on terrorism is not a clash of civilizations. It is not the U.S. versus Islam. It is really a clash between civilization, which is everyone in this room, and those who would seek to destroy it. To defend against the common dangers and build on our common hopes, the United States has and will intend to continue working with the UN and other international organizations, as well as bilaterally with countries like India to combat terrorism. We know that any single vision of the world, even if it's the US vision, is not enough. We need your visions as well. Therefore, because we think that democracy is an absolute good, because we think that tolerance and freedom are basic to democracy, these values will remain central to us just as they are central to you in India. You are, after all, the world's largest democracy. You are, along with the U.S., one of the world's two most diverse democracies. You share with us a constitution which protects the freedom of religion for everyone in India. It's a long, hard struggle. I do not pretend that the U.S. believes that it is perfect. I do not pretend that everyone in the U.S. believes as much as I passionately believe in tolerance. But I do promise you that these are the ideals of the U.S that tolerance and freedom of religion are central to our view of ourselves as a people, just as I think they are central to those of India. As the two largest democracies, India and the U.S., must continue to support freedom. Freedom will not live without your support. Therefore, you must join with us and continue the struggle for freedom and the freedom to practice religion. In many ways, the character of the future that these children here will inherit, that my children will inherit, depends on the success of our action and our cooperation in this difficult time. However, these shared values of freedom and tolerance give us a common bond. We have something very precious that we share. They also give us a shared responsibility to work together for a better future, yours and ours. Thank you.
Assalamu alaikum. It's a privilege to introduce Dr. Zakir Naik. Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik is the president of the Islamic Research Foundation, IRF, an internationally renowned orator on Islam and comparative religion. He is the main driving spirit behind the IRF striving and acclaim for proper presentation, understanding, and clarification of Islam, as well as removing misconceptions about Islam. Though a medical doctor by professional training, he has turned around to spread the truth of Islam to millions worldwide. At only 36 years, Dr. Zakir explains the teachings of Islam and convincingly clears misconceptions about Islam based on Quran and authentic hadith with reason, logic, and science. He quotes extensively and verbatim from the Holy Quran and other religious scriptures. Dr. Zakir is more famous for his critical analysis and spontaneous and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by the audiences and skeptics after his public talks in open question and answer sessions. He has delivered more than 600 public talks in the last six years in several countries in addition to many public talks in India. Many of these talks are available on video and audio cassettes. Dr. Zakir appears regularly on many international TV and satellite TV channels in more than 100 countries of the world. He is regularly invited for TV and radio interviews. He has authored books on Islam and comparative religion. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Ala Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahabi ajmain. Amma abad. Auz billahi min shaitan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَزَاقِ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ رَبِّ شُحَ لِي صَدْرِ وَيَسْرِ لِي أَمْرِ وَحَلُّ الْأُقْدَةَ مِنْ لِسَانِ يَفْكَهُ كَوْلِ The respected chief guests, Dr. Richard Haynes, Dr. Amar Sena, Mr. Krishna Chanchoradia, the other dignitaries, my respected elders and my brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. The topic of this evening's talk is terrorism and jihad, an Islamic perspective. And many of you may be aware that more than 20% of the world population, they are Muslims. More than one-fifth of the world population consists of Muslims. But unfortunately, Islam is also a religion which has the maximum number of misconceptions. The people that have the maximum misconception about any religion as a whole is the religion of Islam, which also happens to be today the fastest growing religion of the world. And these misconceptions are increasing, especially after the 11th of September 2001. And today, number one, top of the list amongst the misconception is terrorism and jihad in Islam. Whenever a person hears about a Muslim, immediately he starts thinking of a fundamentalist or a terrorist. What is the meaning of the word fundamentalist? A fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the fundamentals of a particular subject. For example, if a doctor has to be a good doctor, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of medicine. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of medicine, he cannot be a good doctor. For a scientist to be a good scientist, 
he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of science. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of science, he cannot be a good scientist. For a mathematician, to be a good mathematician, he should know, follow, and practice the fundamentals of maths. Unless he is a fundamentalist in the field of maths, he cannot be a good mathematician. You cannot paint all fundamentalists with the same brush, that all are good or all are bad. Depending upon the field in which a person is a fundamentalist, you can label him accordingly whether he is a good human being or a bad human being. For example, if there is a person who is a fundamentalist robber, a fundamentalist thief, whose profession is to rob, whose profession is to steal, he is a nuisance to society. He is not a good human being. On the other hand, if you have a fundamentalist doctor whose profession is to save human lives, then he is a boon for society. He is a good human being. You can't paint all fundamentalists with the same brush that all are good or all are bad. Depending upon the field in which he is a fundamentalist, you have to label him accordingly. I am proud to be a Muslim fundamentalist because I know, I follow, and I strive to practice the fundamentals of Islam. And I know that there is not a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. And I challenge any human being in the world to point out a single fundamental of Islam from the authentic source of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. There may be certain people who may find that certain teachings of Islam, certain teachings of Quran, they are against humanity. But the moment you give the logical reason for it, the statistical record of the world, there will not be a single human being who can point a single fundamental of Islam which is against humanity as a whole. That's the reason I say I'm proud to be a fundamentalist Muslim. And I say in the same breath, that for a Hindu, to be a good Hindu, he should be a fundamentalist in the field of Hinduism. Unless he's a fundamentalist Hindu, he cannot be a good Hindu. For a Christian, to be a good Christian, he should be a fundamentalist in the field of Christianity. Unless he is a fundamentalist Christian, he cannot be a good Christian. If you read the Webster's Dictionary, it tells us that the word fundamentalism was first coined was first used to describe a group of American Christians who were called as Protestant Christians in the earlier part of the 20th century when they objected to the church. Previously, the Christian church, they believed the message of the Bible was from Almighty God. These Protestant Christians, they protested and they said that not only is the message of the Bible from God, but every word, every letter of the Bible is from God. If any human being can prove that Bible is the word of God, then this movement of fundamentalism is a good movement. On the other hand, if someone proves that Bible is not the word of God, then this movement is not a good movement. If you read the Oxford Dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to the ancient doctrine of any religion. But if you refer to the new edition, the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary, there's a slight change in the definition. It says that fundamentalist is a person who strictly adheres to any ancient doctrine of any religion, especially Islam. <laughs> the word especially Islam has been added in the revised edition of Oxford Dictionary. The moment you hear the word fundamentalist, you start thinking of a Muslim. That is a terrorist. And many a times, two different labels are given for the same activity of the same individual. For example, more than 60 years back, when we were ruled by the British Shahs, when they were controlling India, there were certain Indians who were fighting for their freedom. These group of Indians 
by the British government, they were labeled as terrorists. But those same people, by the common Indians, we call them as patriots, as freedom fighters. Same individual, same activity, two different labels. One group is calling them a terrorist, the other group is calling them freedom fighters, patriots. Same individual, same activity, two different labels. Therefore, before you give a label, you have to try and find out what is the reason that the person is giving the label. If you agree with the British government that Britain had a right to rule over India, you would call all these people as terrorists. But if you agree with the view of the common Indians that the Britishers came to India to do business, they had no right to rule over us, then you would call these people as freedom fighters. Same people, same activity, two different labels. And I'd like to give you one more example of Nelson Mandela, who was the ex-president of the new free South Africa. And we know that by the previous government, the white apartheid government, they called Nelson Mandela earlier as a terrorist and they imprisoned him in Robben Islands for more than 25 years. But the same person, by the indigenous South Africans, they called him as a hero. Same person, same activity, two different labels. If you agree with the previous white apartheid government of South Africa that the color of the skin makes you superior, if your skin's color is white, it makes you superior, then we all have to agree that one of the greatest terrorists on earth was Nelson Mandela. But if you agree with the view of the South Africans, the original inhabitants of South Africa, that the color of the skin does not make you superior, or same as is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Hujurah, chapter 49, verse number 13, it says, Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu inna ka mukmin da Allah yatkaakum inna Allah alimun kabeer O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other not that you shall despise each other and the most honored in the sight of Almighty God is the person who has taqwa the criteria for judgment in the sight of Almighty God is not color of the skin, it's not sex, it's not wealth, but it is taqwa, it is righteousness, it is piety, it is God consciousness. So if we agree with the view of the Quran, and as our beloved Prophet said, he said in the farewell pilgrimage, in the Hajjadul Vida, he said that no Arab is superior to a non-Arab, neither is a non-Arab superior to an Arab, no white man is superior to a black, Neither is a black man superior to a white, except by virtue. So if you agree with the view of the Quran and the saying of the beloved Prophet Muhammad you would not call Nelson Mandela the terrorist, but you would call a person who is fighting for his rights. Therefore, before any person gives any label to any individual for any of his act, we have to first analyze for what reason is he doing the act. The number two on top of the list of misconception in Islam is jihad. And there is a great misconception regarding the meaning of the word jihad, not only amongst the non-Muslims, but even amongst the Muslims. Most of the people, irrespective of whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, they feel that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason whatsoever, irrespective whether it be for personal reasons, for political gain, for regions, for language, for any reason, if any Muslim fights a war, it is called as jihad. It is a great misconception, not only among the non-Muslims, but even among the Muslims, that any Muslim fights a war, it is termed as jihad. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jahada, which means to strive, which means to struggle, which means to exert effort. And in the Islamic context, jihad means to strive against one's own evil inclination. Jihad in Islamic terminology also means to strive to improve the society. It even includes 
to strive in the battlefield in self-defense. And it even includes to strive to fight against tyranny and oppression. Jihad comes from the root word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. For example, if a student strives to pass in his examination, in Arabic, we say he is doing jihad. He is striving, he is struggling to pass in the examination. If an employee strives, struggles to satisfy his employer, irrespective whether the work he is doing is good or bad, it is called as jihad. Irrespective whether the employee, whether he is doing good work or bad work, if he is striving to satisfy his employer, it is called as jihad. Jihad merely means to strive. If a politician strives to acquire vote, irrespective whether it is good or bad, it is referred to in Arabic as jihad. And there is another misconception as far as the word jihad is concerned. Most of the people think, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, that jihad can only be done by Muslims. In fact, there are verses in the Quran in which Almighty God says that even the non-Muslims, they did jihad. The Quran says, in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, that we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail did the mother bore them, and in years twain was they weaning. The next verse, Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 15 says, that but if they strive, but if your parents strive to force you to worship someone else besides me, besides Almighty God, of which you have no knowledge, then do not obey them. Here the Quran says that if your parents strive, they struggle, they do jihad to make you worship somebody else besides Almighty God, do not obey them. So here the Quran says that the non-Muslim do jihad. The same message repeated in Surah an kabut chapter number 29, verse number 8, that we have enjoined on the human being to be kind to the parents. But if they strive, if they do jihad and force you to worship anyone besides me, besides Almighty God, of which you have no knowledge, then do not obey them, but live with them in compassion and love. So here we come to know from the Quran that even the non-Muslim did jihad. Further mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 76, that the believers, they fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the unbelievers, they fight in the way of the Satan. So strive against the brothers of the Satan. Here again, it speaks that the evil people, even they do jihad. So jihad is an Arabic word which merely means to strive, to struggle. In context, called as jihad fi sabilillah. And the evil people, they strive in the way of the Satan. It is called as jihad fi sabi shaitan. So jihad is of two types, good jihad and bad jihad also. Striving for the good cause, striving for an evil cause. But in the Islamic context, if it is not specified, it is taken for granted that the jihad is for a good cause, it is jihad fi sabilillah, it is jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unless specified, it is taken for granted that whenever jihad is mentioned, it means jihad fi sabilillah, jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is another misconception that most of the people, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, they think that jihad means holy war. In fact, if you read the Quran, nowhere is the word holy war used anywhere in the Quran. Nowhere will you find holy war mentioned in any of the authentic hadith of the Prophet, sayings of the Prophet Muhammad The Arabic translation for the English word holy war is Harbum Muqaddasa, which means a holy war. This word is nowhere mentioned in the Quran, nowhere it is mentioned in any of the authentic hadith of the Prophet. This word holy war was initially coined by the Orientalists when they started writing books on Islam and unfortunately many of the Muslim scholars, even they translate jihad as holy war. It's unfortunate. If someone makes a mistake regarding 
the religion of Islam, unfortunately, many of the Muslim scholars, even they use this English translation thinking that the most appropriate translation for the Arabic word jihad is holy war, which is totally wrong. The word which is used in the Quran, it is fighting, it is kital. It means to kill. And again, fighting is of two types. Killing can be of two types for good purpose and bad purpose. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 76, that the believers, they fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the unbelievers, they fight in the way of the Satan. So the believers, let them fight against the brothers of the Satan. That means the evil people, they fight in the way of the devil. And the good people, they fight in the way of Almighty God. So jihad does not mean holy war. And kital merely means to fight. Kital fi sabillillah means fighting in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And kital fi sabi shaitan means fighting in the way of the Satan. This word jihad occurs in the glorious Quran several times, on several occasions. It's even used by our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad may peace be upon him, in several of the authentic hadith. If you read the Quran, it says in the Quran in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 78, it says, that strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you ought to strive, with sincerity and discipline. Strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you ought to strive. Further is mentioned in the glorious Quran. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 20. That as for those believers who suffer exile and who strive with might and men in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their body and wealth and position. These are the people who shall attain the highest rank in the hereafter. They shall attain the salvation. That means it says that all those people, the believers who suffer exile, and if they struggle, if they do jihad, if they strive in the way of Almighty God, doing good things, with all the position, with the body, with the wealth, with the time, these are the people who shall achieve the highest rank in the hereafter, and they shall go to heaven. It's mentioned in the hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 4, hadith number 46, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that a mujahid, a person who strives in Allah's way, and Allah alone knows who really strives in his way with the true intentions, is like a person who continuously fasts and prays. And if a person who is a mujahid, who strives in Allah's way, if he's killed, he shall go to paradise. And if he returns back, he will come back with a great reward as well as booty of the war. The word jihad is referred to in the Quran in several places. Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran, in Surah an kabut chapter number 29, verse number 6, it says that strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you ought to strive. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free of all wants. It says that if you strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are doing for your own selves. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, is free of all wants. It indicates that if you are struggling in the way of Almighty God, it is for your own benefit. It is not for the benefit of Almighty God. Because Almighty God is not dependent on any of his creations. He is independent. He does not require anyone's help. If you are struggling in his way, it is for your own benefit. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 24, Kul in kana abaukum, say with it be for your fathers, wa abnaukum, or your sons, wa ikhwanukum, or your brothers, wa azwajukum, or your spouses, your wives, or husbands, wa ashiratukum, or your relatives, wa amwa lonik taraf tumuha. The wealth you have amassed, the business in which you deal, the house in which you live, 
Allah is saying, what are your considerations? Are they your fathers? Your sons? Your brothers? Your spouses? Your relatives? The wealth you have amassed? The business in which you deal? The house in which you live? What are your considerations? And Allah continues, Ahabba alaykum min allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi If you love all these eight things more than Allah, his messenger and doing jihad in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again the word jihad is used indicating that if you love all these eight things more than almighty God more than the messenger of almighty God or striving or struggling in the way of almighty God then fatarabbasu wait hatta yakti allahu bi amri wallahu ladukum al fasikin wait until Allah brings his decision unto you wait until Allah brings the destruction unto you wallahu ladukum al fasikin and Allah guides not the fasik people Allah says that if you love all these eight things more than Allah Almighty God more than his messenger and striving the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then wait until Allah brings his decision unto you and Allah guides not the fasik people the rebellious people and you find several ahadith of the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa which speaks about jihad it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari Volume number 4, Hadith number 2784. It mentions, Hadith Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet. She asked the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that, shouldn't we go for jihad? And the Prophet said, the best jihad for you is the perfect hajj. On another occasion, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Hadith number 5792 that a person approached the Prophet and said that should I go for jihad and here the jihad struggling refers to fighting against the evil people so a person asked that should I go for jihad to fight against the evil people so the Prophet asks him that do you have parents? the man says yes so Prophet says the best jihad for you is to serve your parents on the other occasion which is mentioned in Sunnah Nisai, Hadith number 4209, that a person asked the Prophet, that which is the best of jihad? And the Prophet said, the best jihad is to speak a word of truth against the tyrant ruler. Here you find that depending upon the situation, the best type of jihad, the best type of struggling keeps on differing. Sometimes the Prophet said, the best jihad is performing perfect hajj that is the perfect pilgrimage on another occasion the prophet said the best jihad is to serve your parents on another occasion the prophet said the best jihad the best struggling the best striving is to speak a word of truth against the tyrant ruler and the beloved prophet Muhammad said it's mentioned in Sayyid ibn Habban that the prophet said a mujahid person who strives a mujahid is a person who strives against his own self for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a muhajir a person who migrates is a person who migrates from evil to good here you find that jihad is used in various different contexts and depending upon the situation the best type of jihad keeps on changing so to understand the concept of jihad, you have to go to the authentic sources, that is the glorious Quran, and the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And here we find, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 208, it says, that, Ya amunu, silmi kafa. O you believe, enter into Islam wholeheartedly and do not follow the khutwat shaitan the footsteps of the devil here Allah is specifically telling that O oh, you believe O oh, believers do not follow the footsteps of the devil on many occasions the Quran says that do not follow the Satan but here Allah says do not follow the footsteps of the Satan is there any difference between following the Satan and following the footsteps of the Satan why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala change the words the reason is that anyone who has little iman, who has little faith, 
If, for example, if a young lady comes and tells him that let's spend the night together, because the person has faith, he will say, no, not at all. It is totally prohibited. It's a sin. And he will not do it. But to the same person who has little faith, if a phone call of a young lady comes, he may say, there is no harm in speaking to a young lady. So he speaks for a couple of times on the phone. Later on, the lady may call that let's have tea together outside. And after a few days, he goes to have tea. Then he may go to a joint like McDonald's and they go to McDonald's. After a few days, they may go to a restaurant to have dinner. And after a few days, they may spend the night together in a hotel. This is khutwatu shaitan, the footsteps of the devil. That the difference between the devil and the footsteps of the devil. If the devil himself comes in front of a person who has faith, he will immediately recognize the devil and will abstain from him. But if the footsteps of the devil come, this is attraction. Only speaking to a young lady, what's the problem? Only having teeth, what's the problem? No problem. Only having a burger in McDonald's, no problem. Only having dinner, no problem. Only sleeping one night, no problem. So Allah says in the Quran, He gives us guidance. Oh, you believe? Enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu. Udkhulu fi salmi kaffa. And do not follow the khutwatu shaitan, the footsteps of the devil, for he is to you an avowed enemy. And one of the best ways, the best type of jihad, the best type of struggling is to convey the message of truth to those who are not aware of it. One of the best type of jihad is dawah, conveying the message of truth of Islam, conveying the message of truth to those who are not aware of it. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 110, "Kuntum khaira ummatin khijat lin nas." O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Allah is giving us the honor and is calling the best of people. There is no honor without responsibility. Allah continues and gives us the responsibility. Because you enjoin what is good and you forbid what is wrong and you believe in Allah. The reason Allah Almighty God is calling us the best of people because we are supposed to enjoin people towards the good and forbid them from doing the wrong. If you do not enjoin what is good, and if a person does not forbid from doing wrong, he is not fit to be called as Muslim. He is not fit to be called as Khaira Ummah, as the best of people. So the reason we are given this honor is because we are supposed to enjoin people to the Haqq and forbid them from wrong. And I started my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran, from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, وَقُلْ جَالْ حَقْ وَزَاكَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ when truth is hurled against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. It is the duty of every person who has the truth that he should convey that truth to those people who are not aware of it. That's the reason, one of the criteria for any human being to attain salvation. The criteria that mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al-Asr, chapter 103, Verse number 1 to 3, which says, Wal Asr. Inna al insana la fi khusr. Illa lazina amnu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqq wa tawasaw bil sabr. That by the token of time, man is really in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. Only faith will not take you to heaven. Besides faith, you should also have righteous deed. You should even exhort people to truth and exhort people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these criteria is missing under normal circumstances according to the verse of the Quran, you shall not enter Jannah. You shall not enter heaven. And today we find that the international media, whether it be the television satellite channels, whether it be the newspapers, whether it be the magazines, you find that Islam is in the firing line. Even on the internet, there is virulent propaganda about Islam. And I personally do agree with the statement of Richard Haynes, the Consul General of USA, 
to Chennai when he said that the American nation is not against Islam. And I do agree with him. I've been to America several times. The American people as a whole, the American people as a whole, I do agree with him. The American people as a whole, they aren't against Islam. And same thing, I tell my Indian brothers, that the Indian Hindus as a whole, they aren't against Islam. They aren't. We have got several Hindu friends. No problem. It is only a small group of Indians. For the personal gains, they may try to malign Islam. It may be a small group of Westerners. For the personal gain, they may try to malign Islam. For the personal reasons. Some people, because they want to come in power, it's an easy vote bank to create a tension between two communities. Some people, to divert the mistakes made by the head of state, he diverts the attention by creating another scenario, making Islam in the firing line. So, I do agree that as a whole, the American nation is not against Islam. As a whole, the non-Muslims of India aren't against Islam. It is only a selected few. And these people, they are controlling the media. According to Time magazine, an article came on the 16th of April, 1979. It said that more than 60,000 books were written against Islam in a span of 150 years more than 60,000 books written against Islam in a span of 150 years. And if you calculate, according to this article of Time magazine, more than one book is written against Islam every day. Every day. And the media, I blame the media and I blame the politicians. The problem that we have today in the world, according to me, the root cause is the media and the politicians. I'm sorry if I hurt anyone's feeling. I'm not targeting any particular people, but just, this is my opinion, that the media, if you analyze, I know there are many journalists out here, so, but as I mentioned in the morning, that the many journalists who are truthful and they really give a good view, it is, when I say majority, it means more than 50%. It doesn't mean all. It means more than 50%. And if we analyze that today, selectively, the Muslims are being targeted on the media. For example, if a Muslim woman wears a hijab, she's targeted. On the same hand, we find nuns when they wear a similar type of dress covering the complete body except the face and hands up to the wrist. The people, they respect them. Why? Why the difference? If a Muslim keeps a beard, it's an indication of a terrorist. The Sikhs, they keep the beard, there's no problem. They wear the turban, there's no problem. And when I went to Canada the first time in the 90s, there's an article that the Sikh, he fought for his right that he was a Canadian. He fought for his right that he will not remove his turban in the Canadian army and he won the case. Last month an article came that the Sikh, he objected in the court of law of Britain that he will not take out his turban in the college and, and they won the case. Here we find that a person who keeps a beard, people feel that, you know, I don't know what harm can a beard do. And that happened even in Madras. I came along with some of my colleagues and we came to the hotel yesterday and my colleagues, you know, even they have a beard and they wear a cap. So there were some police who started following and started questioning just because of the beard and the cap. What harm can a beard do? It can't even harm a fly. What harm can a cap do? Fine, if somebody is carrying a gun and you question him, it's fine. If somebody is carrying certain things you find suspicion, it's fine. Imagine a beard, it can't even harm a fly. And you analyze all the saintly people of most of the religion, that beard, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, supposed to be the messenger of Islam and even considered as by the Christians in what it comes as God, he had a beard. All the sons and sadhus, they have a beard. All the religious personalities, almost all, if not all, if you analyze in the religion, if you see on the higher level, they have beard. So what's the problem in a beard? There's no problem at all. So this is the hype of the media. It is the hype of the media. It is selectively targeting. 
So because of this, you find the scenario today that there is a misconception about Islam. And I blame the Muslims also that we aren't actually conveying the message of truth to them. We aren't doing our job. And we find that certain verses of the Quran are called out of context. And one of the most famous verses of the Quran in which the critics they try and say that, oh, Quran says wherever you find a non-Muslim, you kill him. And one of the famous critics of India, as you know, Arun Shuri, he wrote a book called The World of Fatwa. And he writes in his book and he quotes the Quran in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5. He says, the Quran says, wherever you find a kafir, into brackets Hindu, into brackets Hindu, wherever you find a kafir, into bracket Hindu, you kill him. You wait for him in every stratagem of war. So imagine if a common Hindu, I know some Hindu reads this, whoo, Quran says that wherever you find a Hindu, kill him, then immediately there will be a reaction. He will start going against Islam. So the problem is that selected few people for their own ulterior motives, because of their writing, then he wrote the book, The World of Fatwa, and he quotes the same verse which has been called by Orientalist. Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 5, giving reference. After verse number 5, he jumps to verse number 7 directly. Any intelligent person will know. Why? Because verse number 6 has the key, the reply to his allegation. In context, if you read Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, the first few verses speaks about a peace treaty between the Muslims and the Mushriks of Makkah. This peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah. So by the time Almighty God reaches verse number 5, he says that in the battlefield, that wherever you find your enemy, kafir means an unbeliever enemy, wherever you find the enemy, you kill him. In the battlefield, if anyone quotes out of context, it will sound absurd. Imagine a few decades earlier, there was a war between USA and Vietnam. And if the Army General of USA or the President of USA tells the American soldiers in the battlefield that my soldiers, don't get scared. Wherever you find the Vietnamese, kill him. It is to boost up the morale. But today, if someone quotes that the President of America said that wherever you find the Vietnamese, kill him, you will make him sound like a butcher. It's out of context. And but naturally, any army general, to boost up the morale, he will give moral support to his soldiers. So similarly, when Almighty God says in the Quran to the believers that when the enemies come to kill you, don't get scared, you kill them. So what's harm in it? And the next verse, verse number 6 says that if the unbelievers, if they seek asylum, it does not say let them go. It says if they seek asylum, if they seek peace, escort them to a place of security so that they may hear the word of Allah. The Quran does not say if the enemy wants peace, let them go. The Quran says escort them to a place of security. Today, the most generous army general, the maximum military soldier, that if the enemy wants peace, let them go. Which army general will say that escort them to a place of security? But this is what Quran says. If you read in context, you come to know the real message of the Quran. And you pick up any religious scripture. I am a student of compiled religion. I have read the Ramayana, Mahabharat, Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, six scriptures, Jain scriptures. I have read it. And you find that in certain occasion or the other, almost all the scriptures, some way or the other, they have mentioned fighting. They have mentioned killing. I can give quotations. If you read the Bible, in the book of Exodus, of the Old Testament, chapter number 22, verse number 18 to 20, it says kill. Exodus, chapter number 32, says kill. Numbers, says kill. New Testament, if you read Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, it says kill. And if you remember the story of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, when he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he tells to one of the apostles to take a sword and stand there. And that apostle, he uses the sword to chop off the ear. So you find that fighting has been prescribed in almost all the scriptures. You read the Hindu scriptures. Mahabharat is a scripture. It is what? Bhagavad Gita chapter number 2. And you know that when Arjun, when he feels sad, that when he has to fight his relatives, Arjun says, how can I kill my relatives? There are thousands of people ahead in front of me. How can I kill them? So Lord Arjun, Arjun, he is given guidance by Lord Krishna. And Lord Krishna tells him that as far as for the truth, 
When you're on the truth, you don't have to see who's in front of you, whether it's a relative or who it is. And that is correct. Truth prevails much more higher than the blood relations. Same thing the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 135. Ya amunu. Oh, you believe, stand out firmly for justice as truth to Almighty God, even if it be against yourself, against your parents, against the rich or against the poor. Allah protects all. So if you study all the scriptures, all the scriptures somewhere or the other, sometime or the other, they have mentioned about fighting. That doesn't mean you pick up that verse of Exodus, you pick up that verse of Bhagavad Gita and say that, you know, Bhagavad Gita says that I have to kill your relatives. It's out of context. So here we have to analyze that to get a communal harmony, the best thing we have to do is we have to go back to our scriptures. If you go back to our scriptures, you'll come to know what is mentioned in the scriptures, which is the authentic source of every religion. And we find that the Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, it says that if anyone kills any human being, whether it be a Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. The Quran says if any human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, kills any other human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And the verse continues. And if anyone saves any human being, it is as though he has saved the whole nation. And as far as Kital fighting the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Kital is concerned, there are certain guidelines laid down in the Quran and the sayings of the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu wa sallam, that even as a last resort, if you have to fight, if ever you have to fight the evil people, there are certain guidelines laid down. And Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 190, that fight against those who fight you. But do not commit excesses. Do not transgress the limits. For Allah does not like those who transgress limits. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 194, that fight those who fight you until there is no more tumult and oppression. And there are several guidelines laid down in the Quran and the Hadith regarding if you have to fight as a last resort in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you fight, you should not harm the women, you should not harm the children, you should not harm the elderly people who are at their home, you should not break monasteries, you should not harm the religious people, you should not burn down trees, you should not uproot the trees, you should not burn the crops, you should not kill the animals. There's a big list of do's and don'ts. And according to a book written by Ramakrishna Rao, he writes on the life history of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He says that in all the fighting that took place at the time of the Prophet, all these years, 22 years, he gives a calculation from his own sources that 1,018 people were killed. How many? 1,018. Do you know the statistics of First World War? How many were killed? How many were killed? How many? 20 million people. 10 million soldiers and 10 million civilians. Second World War, 30 million people were killed. And another 34 million injured. Compare. We find that if you go back to the source, you'll come to know the real reason and the real philosophy behind the statement of the verse of the Quran. And one of the most common allegations today that we have, or Again, top of the list, the common misconception is that Islam was spread by the sword. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It comes from the word silm, which means peace, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. And if anyone who submits his will to Almighty God to acquire peace, he's called as a Muslim. Imagine if you translate the statement, Islam was spread by the sword, it means peace was spread by the sword. And Islam, as a general norm, it is against violence. But as a last resort, force can be used. And in every country of the world, every country of the world has a police. And this police too 
if suppose the civilian or the citizens or anyone else, if they do not follow the law of the country, this police, it uses force to let peace prevail in that country. So when every country has a police, and when they can use force, they can keep guns. And if Islam is against violence, it mainly promotes peace. As a last resort, because some people do not want peace, and they want to disrupt the peace, to control these people as a last resort, Islam gives permission for the use of force and violence, as a last resort. The reply to this misconception that Islam was prepared with the sword is given very well by a famous historian by the name of Delacy O'Leary. He writes in his book, Islam at the Crossroad, on page number 8, and he says that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. Delethi O'Leary writes in his book, Islam at the Crossroad, that history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping across the world, forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered races is the most fantastic, absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. And we know that we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. We did not force anyone to accept Islam at the point of the sword. Later on the crusaders came and they wiped out the Muslim. There was not a single Muslim who could openly give the azan. The Muslims, we were the lord of the Arab land for the past 1400 years. For a few years the Britishers came, for a few years the French came, but as a whole, the Arab Muslims were the lord of the Arab land for the past 1400 years. Yet today, yet today, there are more than 14 million Arabs who are Coptic Christians. Coptic Christians means Christians since generations. These 14 million Coptic Christian Arabs, they are bearing witness, they are giving shahada that Islam was not spread by the sword. The Muslims ruled India for about a thousand years. If they wanted, they could have forced every Indian to accept Islam at the point of the sword. Today, after a thousand years, we find in India that more than 80% of the Indians, they are non-Muslims. These 80% non-Muslims Indian, they are bearing witness, they are giving shahada that Islam was not spread by the sword. Which Muslim army, which Muslim army went to Malaysia? Malaysia happens to be a country which has more than 50% Muslims. Which Muslim army went to Indonesia? which is a country which has the maximum number of Muslims in the world. Which Muslim army went to the east coast of Africa? Which Muslim army? Which sword? Thomas Carlyle gives a reply. He again is a famous historian from Europe. And he says, which sword? First you have to get your sword. Every new idea originates in the mind of one. In one man's head it originates. One man against the full world. One against everyone else. It will do little good that he picks up a sword and propagates it. First, you have to get your sword. He is referring to the sword of intellect, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. We have statistics today. The article that came in the Plain Truth magazine, which was a reproduction of the Redigious Almanac yearbook, 1986. It gave the statistics of the increase in the major world religion in a span of 50 years, between 1934 to 1984. And it said that number one religion to grow maximum was Islam, 235%. In a span of 50 years, Islam grew by 235%. Christianity, only 47%. I am asking a question. Which war took place between 1934 and 1984 which forced the non-Muslim to accept Islam? <laughs> which war? Today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in UK is Islam. I am asking a question. 
that I want to know that which Muslim is forcing the Americans to accept Islam. I'm asking the question that which Muslim is forcing the Europeans to accept Islam. There's freedom of speech in America. There's freedom of speech in Europe. If Islam subjugates women, then why should the non-Muslim women accept Islam? How come those people are accepting Islam, two-thirds of them are women? Because Islam has the solution to the problems of the humankind. According to statistics of care, it's the Council of America in Washington, it said that two months after 11 September, two months after 11 September, 20,000 Americans accepted Islam. And after the 11th September, I was there on the 9th of September, two days before I left. Otherwise, I too would have been. <laughs> I was there in UK. And after 11 September, in a span of just hardly five, six months, thrice I was called to UK only to give talks on terrorism. And it's good. The act is bad. Act is bad. What Salman Rushdie did. What Salman Rajdi wrote against the Prophet was bad. But people wanted to know what did Salman Rajdi write and they read the Quran to find the truth and they accepted Islam. Today in America, these are statistics from the leading newspaper of America, even New York Times, it said the American wants to know that can I have a Bible of the Muslims? They don't even know that Quran is the holy book. They want to read the Bible of the Muslims. It's good. And the moment you have interaction with the truth, as I started my talk by quoting a verse of the Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81, which says, Wakul jal haq wa zaqal batil. Inna la batil akana zauka. When truth is heard in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. We have to use the sword of intellect, the sword of reasoning, which is conquering the hearts. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, He gives a promise in the Quran in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33. In Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9. As well as in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 20, with a different ending, Allah says, Huwallazi arsala rasoolahu bil huda. What deen al haq? Leave hero al deen kulli. Allah qadhi al mushikun. Allah has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other isms. And Islam is destined to supersede all the other isms. And Allah says, however much the unbelievers don't like it. And Allah gives a different ending in Surah Fatah, chapter 14, verse 28, which says, وَقَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَيْدًا And enough is Allah as a witness. I would like to end my talk of this topic, terrorism and jihad, an Islamic perspective, with a quotation and a statement of Dr. Adam Pearson, who said, People who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs, they fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad was born. Now we begin with the more interesting part of the program, that is, the question answer session. Please pose one question at a time. May we have the first question? Introduce Sir, yourself. my name is Vasikaran. I am a Christian. And we are told that the crusaders on the crusades were waging a holy war. I am a Christian, sir. I am a journalist. We were told that the crusaders on the crusades were waging a holy war. And now after seeing the films, we know how ter much terrorism they did to the innocent Muslims and do. Do you not think that uh, this religious terrorism started from these crusades and it is in another way it continues against the Muslims through all these centuries. The big, now this terrorism seems to be in uh, another phase and uh, why these westerners are always after the crusades continuing this uh, sort of thing against uh, well, that's a very good question. He being a Christian, he says that he was told that the crusade is a holy war and that's what I told you. The Orientalists used this word, holy war for jihad. It was nothing but the usage of holy war, was another name for crusade. 
to see to it that everyone joins and think it's religious. And the brother, being a journalist, has rightly said that now we realize that these crusades were nothing but terrorizing the innocent Muslims. I didn't say anything about this in my talk because I came here to speak about the Islamic concept. I didn't touch on any religion, negative point of any religion, neither do I want to touch. It is just, I said that all religion prescribe fighting to let peace prevail. That's what everyone does. I never touched on any religion. That's not what I've come here for. But if you ask me a question, I have to say, yes, you're right, brother, that the crusade did terrorize the innocent Muslims. And that's how it has continued. And now, the same thing what they do, they are now saying the same thing to the Muslims, which if you analyze, you see in the world around you. You see in the world around you that how many people are actually accepting it. Today, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. There may be still incidences somewhere in the world. There are black sheep in every community. But you will not be able to point out as a whole that where in the world are people forcing other non-Muslims to accept Islam at the point of the sword. No way. In fact, they are getting harassed because they are Muslims. Now, this thing can only be solved if you go back, if you go back to the Bible. If you read the Bible, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 40, 41, he says that if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, offer him the other. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, offer him the other. If someone asks you to walk one mile, you walk with him twain. If someone asks for the shirt, you give him the cloak. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, a messenger of Almighty God, he shows us how peace should prevail. He says, love your neighbor. So if you analyze, if you go back to the scripture, I don't find any way where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself prescribed that you should harass the Muslims. So therefore I tell all the human beings that go back the scripture which you consider to be the most holiest, whichever scripture you consider, at least go back to your scripture, as the Quran says in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 64, Come to come in terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na uda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Hope that's a good My name is Sri Raja. Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the most merciful and the most beneficent. The Prophet Muhammad, Rasulullah, let peace be upon him. Actually, I am a non-Muslim. My brother is Saifullah. Actually, he is standing the dais. Everyone can see him. He has embraced Islam in my family. And he is having so much problem with the parents, actually. That is not my question now. Actually, I belong to the fraternity of law. I would just like to just make a suggestion that the non-Muslims can ask any question. In topic, out of the topic, this is the opportunity. They don't get the opportunity. I would not mind answering any question. If it's from non-Muslim, It will be my pleasure to answer any question in the topic or the topic on religion, on any religion. It will be a pleasure. Yes, brother, most welcome to continue. Yeah. My question is basically for my friend. Actually, he is a disabled person. He is physically handicapped. He is asking whether there is any intention of the God or there is any verse or any sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. What is the criteria for a God to create handicapped or disabled persons? That's it. And I think mic will not be available after my asking the question. So, for the Islamic Information Center and Dr. Fatima Musafar and Dr. Zagin Naik, thanks for giving me this beautiful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, asked a very good question. That, why, what is the reason that Almighty God has created some people who are handicaps? Brother, the reason is given in the Quran. In Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, which says, Al-Lazi khalaq al wal hayata. It is Allah who has created death and life. Test which of you is good in deeds. This question posed by you, brother, that why were some people created? Handicapped, some poor, some people were defective, congenital heart disease. This question even troubled the philosophers of Hinduism. And that's the reason the Hindu philosophers, they came up with a philosophy known as samskara, the cycle of birth and rebirth. If you read in the Vedas, I'm a student of comparative religion, Veda speaks about punna janam. Punna means next, janam means birth, next birth. Even the Quran speaks about life after death, 
but nowhere do the Vedas speak about life than death, life than death, life than death. There is no cycle. But because the Hindu philosophy is based on the logic, karma, every karma based on dharma, it has an action, has a reaction. So based on that, the Hindu philosophers came up with the philosophy that maybe in the previous birth, these people, they did some evil thing, that's the reason in this life they are born handicapped. Though this is not mentioned in any of the verses of the Vedas. Veda is supposed to be one of the most authentic scriptures of the Hindus. And you find nowhere in the Veda is mentioned. Only Purna Janam is mentioned, which means next life, which also the Christians believe, which even the Muslims believe. Because they could not give the reply why some people are born deaf, some people are born with heart disease. They came with a philosophy and a logic that human beings, they die, then they keep on changing forms. And if you did some bad deeds in the last life, in this life you are born handicapped. And they say that if a person does good deeds in next life, he will be born on a higher level. And the best level of living creature is the human being. If you do bad deeds in this life, next life you may be born as a lower being, maybe as a cat or maybe as a dog, as a lower being. If you do good deeds as a higher being, I ask this question, that today crime in the world is increasing or decreasing? Increasing or decreasing? Increasing or decreasing? Increasing, unanimous decision, increasing. Today the population of human beings in the world increasing or decreasing? Increasing. If I agree with the logic that good deeds make you an inferior being, then the population of human beings should decrease. But yet the query, why some human beings are born handicapped, some poor, some congenital defect, the reply is given, as I said in the Quran, in Surah Mul, chapter 16, verse number 2, Allah khalaqal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. This life you are leading in this world is a test for the hereafter. And based on the examination that is given to you, you will be judged. And Almighty God judges different people in different ways. See, when you appear for an examination, every year the examination paper keeps on differing. If you have the same paper, then where is the test? The paper should keep on changing. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests different people in different ways. Some people he gives wealth. If he gives them wealth, the Islamic Sharia says, you have to give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity. It is called a zakat. For a poor person, he doesn't have to give zakat. He gets 100 out of 100 in zakat. You know, the rich person is more difficult, as Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said. It is impossible for the rich person to go to paradise. And Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, it is difficult for a rich person to go to heaven. If he analyze that depending upon the facility Almighty God has given you, he will judge you accordingly. So if he has given you wealth, you have to give charity. If he has given no wealth, then you have to give no charity. Some people, he makes them born with congenital defects. They are born handicapped. So someone may ask me that what is the fault of that young child? What sin did he do? We believe in Islam that every child is masoom. Every child is innocent. He is sinless. But when he's come in this life, maybe as Allah says in the Quran, the wealth and your children and your wives are a test for you. It may be a test for the parents. Almighty God may be wanting to test the parents. The parents may be very pious. Maybe believing in God. Now God wants to test them with a more difficult examination. That now I make your children born handicapped. Then God wants to test, do you yet have faith in Almighty God? And more difficult the test, the higher is the reward. For example, if you want to appear for a simple BA graduation examination, the test is easy. To appear for an MBBS graduation examination, it is more difficult. But the moment you pass MBBS, in front of your name, you get doctor. That's still difficult. But the moment you pass, you get doctor. A more superior honor. So more difficult the test, higher is the reward. So Almighty God tells different people in different ways. Just because a person is handicapped, that does not mean that he did sin in his previous life. He is innocent. The handicapped person, maybe it's a test for his parents. Maybe it's a test for that person himself. That God wants to test him. That yet, does he believe in the Creator or not? That's the reason some people he makes poor, to be born in a poor environment, some people rich environment, some people are born healthy, some people are born handicapped, and depending upon the examination he gives you. You know, when we have a 100 meters dash, there are some people who get handicapped. They start from a 50 meters mark. 
because if a person who has slight defect in the leg to make the race equal he gets a 50 meters lead if almighty god has seen to it that certain facilities have been taken away from certain human beings his test will be accordingly if the examination paper is difficult the teacher corrects the paper leniently if the examination paper is very easy the teacher corrects the paper very strictly so similarly Almighty God has created different human beings in different ways, in different colors, in different languages, in different atmospheres. And depending upon the atmosphere they have been provided by Almighty God and the facility they have been given, they will be judged accordingly. Hope that answers the question. Uh, this is regarding the many books which were written against Islam, which led to the belief that uh, a lot of people worldwide that our religion was wrong, the Quran was wrong and our prophets were wrong. Among these people who believed in it, there were a lot of Christians who believe in the Bible too. And the Bible and the Quran have nearly the same prophets. We have Jesus Christ too, we have Moses too. So why today is the term terrorist used only in respect to Muslims? This is a good question that when Quran and Bible there are so many similarities, so why is this word specifically used? in terms with Muslims. As I told my talk sister, this word fundamentalism initially was coined to describe a group of Christians in America in the early part of the 20th century when they objected to the church. So this word was coined for the Christians initially. The first time it was used in English language. It was coined to describe the Christians. But today, as I told you, they have turned the tables over. So now they use it more to describe Muslims. Why it is the case? Regarding similarities, I have given the talk, sister, similarities between Islam and Christianity. Where I have described that there are various similarities between Islam and Christianity in the Quran and the Bible. So at least we, as human beings, let us agree to follow these similarities. The differences we can talk later. But the reason that they are doing this, as I told you, because Islam today is the fastest growing religion in the world. The people may be fearing that if Islam grows, maybe what they call as pleasure, they may have to give it up. Good evening, sir. My name is Vasudha Tyagarajan. I'm a law student, actually. Firstly, I would like to thank you for giving us such an informative talk on uh, terrorism and Islam. My question is, uh, what do you think is the reason for the sudden increase in the number of terrorist organizations which are basically Islamic and they fight in the name of Islam? And since you say that uh, Islam is giving the guidelines is that uh, women, children, elderly people shouldn't be injured or killed, uh, but there have been various bomb blasts and killings of women and children. What do you think is the reason for that? Thank you. The sisters asked a very relevant question that what is the reason that there's increase in terrorist organization among the Muslims and so many bomb blasts and especially when Islam says you should not kill children, etc., what is the reason? And that's a very good question. Personally, tell you again that personally I haven't met and interviewed any so-called 100% hardcore terrorist. I haven't met. But I can give the reasons, the logical answers why such thing may be happening. Number one, some people may really be terrorizing the innocent people. Some Muslims may be on the wrong track. They may not be following the guidance of the Quran. Like you have black sheep in every community. One of the number one terrorists of human history, who it is? It is Hitler. He has incinerated six million Jews. So can I blame Christianity for that? Hitler was a Christian. So I can't say because Hitler incinerated six million Jews, therefore Christianity says that you have to. He alone, if you add up all the terrorist organizations put together, I doubt whether it'll reach six million. One individual alone, again Mussolini. Mussolini is a Christian. So just because Mussolini killed thousands of innocent people, that does not mean I can blame Christianity for that. So there may be certain black sheep in the community, black sheep, maybe calling themselves Muslims, and maybe in the wrong, maybe. Point number two. It can be that there are people who are harassed. Like you asked me, that today there is no Indian fighting for the freedom of the country. Do you find any Indian fighting for the freedom of the country? No. But 100 years back, got several. So if you ask me, Brother Zakir, why did 100 years back, there were many Indians fighting for the freedom? Because the British government ruled India. That's the reason people are fighting for their freedom. Today, the British government has gone back. So no one is fighting for the freedom. 
So maybe these Muslims may actually be harassed. They may be being harassed. And you find this in several parts of the world, in Palestine, etc. That you find that maybe if you go to the history, if you go back to the history and you find that they have really been harassed and if no one is coming out to help them, they are resorting to whatever means they have. Like the example which is given in the Bible, David and Goliath. The stone was sufficient. So, who is to blame? We are to blame. We are to blame that we aren't going to the root cause of the problem. If there is a terrorist organization, we have to go and really find out what is the reason that they have resorted to terrorism. The only way we can solve this problem. Just by killing them, these terrorists, it will not solve the problem. If you kill one, there will be ten emerging. What we have to do, we have to go and find out what is the reason. Why are you resorting to this method? We have to go back to the root cause. It is like giving the example of Palestine. When Hitler insulted six million Jews, the Jews were kicked out from Germany. And the Palestinians, they said, Helen was Helen, you are our cousins, come and join us. It is like I tell a stranger that if you have a problem, come and stay in my house. After a few years, he kicks me out of the house. And when I start making a noise outside my house, that see, these people have entered my house, so you call me a terrorist. <laughs> Am I a terrorist? I have welcome a person with a stranger, just as a human brother, I got him to the house. After a few months, he kicks me out and when I say that I want my house back, you say that I am a terrorist. Who is to blame? We are to blame. We are to blame. We have to find out that what is the cause of the problem. If we, who Almighty God has given us intelligence, has given even the power and to get together, if we get to the root cause, you will come to know that why should a person want to die? Who would like to die? Who would like to die? A person who says that I say I'm going to get killed, so why not I die and take somebody else also? So if you ask the psychologists, they will tell you the root cause is we have to go and ask these people that why are you doing all this? And many a times you'll find out that the truth is lying behind it. And the truth is that they may be being harassed and some people may really be terrorists. Some people may be terrorists and the people for money, some people for fame, some people for politics. So I do agree, sister, that but majority what I feel that they are being troubled whether it be Muslim, whether it be Hindu, whether it be Christians, there has to be a backlash if a person cannot bear whatever torture that he's undergoing. He resorts, the psychologists say, and I'm a medical doctor, I have done my studies in medicine, they have to retaliate. It is human nature. So why should a person who would not like to raise a finger would like to carry a gun in the hand? Why? So what we have to do, we have to find the root cause and try and solve this problem. That's the only way we can see to it that these terrorizing, the innocent people will stop and all human beings can live together as one brotherhood. Yeah, myself is uh, Ravi Kumar. I'm a software engineer. And uh, my first request to my fellow Indians is don't always relate September 11 with the terrorism because so many things have happened in India. More than 20,000 people have been killed in Kashmir. 2,000 Muslim brothers have been killed in Gujarat. So, we have so many instances to link with terrorism in India itself. Like we can link December 13th to terrorism. And the day in which Akshardham temple people have entered, that we can link it with the terrorism. My... I thank uh, Mr. Jagir Nayak for clearing the misconception about the jihad. My question is that you told that uh, just for the sake of one person, you cannot uh, attack the country. Now, I am asking about the imaginary scenario. Suppose I am going to the some Arab country, I am causing a great devastation, I am killing lakhs and crores of people there, and I am coming back to the India. And uh, the country is giving a proof to me, a proof to Indian government, stating that this person has caused the devastation. And the Indian government is repeatedly still, uh, telling that uh, proof what is given by you is not valid. And that proof is being shared with the other countries. They all agree. And suppose the country repeatedly is not ready to surrender me. Then what is the action that particular country has to take? Uh, let, let just, uh, I have not completed. And another thing is the proof of that country is previously also when that kidnapped plane entered that. They encouraged the kidnappers. They allowed the terrorists who have come in that plane to
to escape out of the country if that is the status of the country then what is the action that particular country has to take it you are telling suppose i have come after causing a devastation i have come back to india indian government is not ready to surrender me and the proofs have been given and indian government is repeatedly telling the proof what you have given is not valid what is the action that country has to take the brother has asked a very good question and a very relevant question a very good analogy between what's happened 11 september again though he came back to 11 september <laughs> analogy is very good that he as a person goes and crosses an arab country kills thousands of people devastation comes back and the arab country gives proof to the indian government indian government does not accept mulla umar again he is not my friend he told usa he told usa give me proof and the usa government could not give proof they shared it with tony blair they shared with musharraf musharraf is saying that i have got enough proof i have seen the proof when you are asking the afghanistan government to give the culprit the afghanistan government is telling me at least give us proof when they could not give proof to afghanistan government and they are sharing it with tony blair it is illogical that means there is something fishy in the proof till today till today till today osama bin laden is prime suspect it's only hypothesis the proof should be solid proof and if they had given solid proof that osama bin laden had done it afghanistan had to hand over osama bin laden we didn't do if you do something to the arab country and arab country gives proof and if indian government objects then you can go to the international court of law where is the international court of law taking place in case of osama bin laden where is it where is it there are international guidelines do you know the rule of international guidelines if suppose there is an extradition policy between the foreign countries for example if a person like india and uk have an extradition policy if any criminal of india does a crime and goes to uk they can ask for the criminal back and one of the example nadim you know nadim the music director the indian government said that he was involved in gulshan's murder so when they gave the proof in uk government in the uk court of law the uk court of law said your proof is nonsense they sued the government indian government indian government had to pay the charges of the advocates of nadim enough proof they gave they didn't agree they say your proof is not valid did india wage a war against uk why didn't they wage a war why didn't they wage but the indian government gave proof at least there usa didn't give proof to afghanistan at all so even now if you go to a saudi land or any arab land and if you do something and if saudi arabia gives proof here that you are the culprit even if the indian government doesn't agree saudi government or any arab country cannot bombard the 1 billion indians it doesn't give permission <laughs> islam doesn't give permission that even if you are the culprit even if you have killed 1 million people they can come and catch you if they have the power they can't bombard the innocent people they can't they can't do it it's not allowed in islam same thing you are saying let's talk about the present scenario in kashmir in gujarat in akshadam i say that whatever may be the background why those two terrorists entered in islam you cannot destroy the monasteries you cannot kill the religious people when anyone goes in a monastery in a place of worship in a temple and killing innocent people it is against the quran it is against the quran we have to condemn it just because those two people whatever the reason was and they got a letter that they believe they came from tehreek e qisas qisas is an arabic word which means you can take revenge and it said it was the cause was because maybe their family was killed even if their family was killed they have no right to kill 44 people <laughs> the cause was maybe somebody else but the action was wrong just because somebody killed if they knew who the person had killed the family members if they have gone and taken revenge with that person was separate how can they kill other 44 people who are innocent so in islam also even if you know who the main culprit is as i said in my talk in surah maida chapter 5 verse 32 if anyone kills any other human being unless it be for murder or for creating mischief in the land it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity only if you know who the person is if he has done mischief and then murder that is the only way that you can kill him for no other reason can you kill anyone else islam condemns that as though you have killed the whole of humanity hope that answers the question 
Assalamu alaikum brother. As a Muslim, personally, I want to ask you this question. In the current socio-political, theological climate of stark black and white prevalent in the world today, I find it extremely difficult to endorse any faction or even my own notions of right and wrong. Ruling out the validity of the prejudice, it is an accepted norm today that it is the followers of the faith who reflect the faith itself. Assuming such an argument, how can I make a stand? How can I preserve the solidarity of my faith when there is a basic conflict of opinion between me and my Islamic peers? As an individual, would you personally endorse the stand of a Saddam Hussein, the passion of a Mujahideen fighter, or the death of a Palestinian suicide bomber? The sister asked the question that seeing the conflicting views and ideas, she doesn't know where she fits in. Who should she agree with? Who should she not agree with? What should she say? She's asking the question that, do I agree with what's happening, the Palestinian Mujahideens, what's happening about Saddam Hussein, etc. Sister, as I told you, many a time these issues are political. What I say, that everything has a hidden agenda and because I keep on traveling a lot, and again, right or wrong, Allah alam, I can't say this is the thing, but mainly the cause are a few selected people and the politicians. Again, the politicians. For political reasons, they make someone the scapegoat and that's the reason they want to see to it that the ulterior motives have been solved. Me as a Muslim, if you ask me, that what should I say if someone asks me? I can only speak the truth. If someone has caused them harm, if someone has murdered them, etc., etc., in this way, if the retaliate is allowed, otherwise they cannot. You ask me what's happening about a particular individual case, Osama bin Laden or Saddam Hussein, I say, I don't know the background. I cannot give a fatwa, I can't give a verdict on them because I haven't interviewed them. For me to give my opinion, I have to interview them. So what I say, Allah, Allah, Allah knows best. Allah will not ask me on the day of judgment, is Osama bin Laden a terrorist or not? I will tell that if he has done wrong, if he has broken the guidelines of Quran and Sunnah, he is wrong. If he hasn't broken, he is good. That is not my basis to pass the examination. What I have to read? I have to read the Quran. I have to read the scripture. This question can be dealt with those who are experts who keep on traveling to Afghanistan, taking an interview, etc. And we find such coming in the paper, etc. You as a Muslim, me as a Muslim, Allah will not, Almighty God will not ask us the question of dear judgment that do you agree Saddam Hussein is a terrorist or not? We have to say, Allah alam, we don't know. Neither do we support them, neither do we condemn them. If there's solid proof of a particular person, of a particular Muslim who has done an act which is proven to be against the Quran, then we have to condemn him. But if there's no proof, which is substantial proof, we have to remain neutral. That's what Quran says. And your faith has into Sheikh sister. Your faith should be based on the truth which is mentioned in the scripture. The best way to see to it that the faith is reinforced is to read the Quran. You will not find any defect in the Quran. You will not find any contradiction in the Quran. <laughs> if a person doesn't understand Arabic as a language, you have to read the translation of this book. This is the translation by Abdullah Yusuf Ali and the translation is available outside in the foyer. That sister, if you read how to lead a life based on the Quran, inshallah, faith will become strong. And believe me, you will not feel shy at all to practice any of the fundamentals of Islam if you know the reason and logic why these fundamentals have been prescribed. If you know that, believe me, I keep on traveling in different parts of the world. I mean, I speak, I go with this cap, I have a beard, I go to different western countries, never have I faced a problem, sometimes query, inquiry is there, but never is a problem. I mean, why should I get scared to speak the truth? So if you have knowledge of the scripture and you know the reason and logic, you will feel proud. Even you too will call yourself like me, you will also call yourself a Muslim fundamentalist. Assalamu alaikum. I am Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Abdullah. Uh, sir, we are still on this 11th September. I want to say something on this, that as you told that, uh, as you told that there is something fishy in the proof, that's why they didn't prove, uh, put the proof. I got this fish on the net, uh, there is a site in the ININ.com, ININ.net, that have been banned actually, but I got one page in that, that there were two pictures displayed on that, 
one was the actor who acted as Osama bin Laden in the film displayed to all. Another was Osama bin Laden. And the title was, any fool with two eyes can see easily that these two persons are not same. That is the proof. Well, America put it before that. Another thing, my question is that uh, I was, I'm working in HL. We are given a handbook which contains do's and don'ts. On the top page of the handbook, there's written uh, Bhagavad Gita Shlok. A part of the Bhagavad Gita Shlok, I'll decide the whole Shlok, like Yada Yada Hi Dharmasya, Glanir Bhavati Bharata, Abhyuddhanam Adharmasya, Tadatmanam Sujamyam, Pritranaya Shadhunam, Binashaya Chatuskrita, Dharmasan Sthapanarthaya Shambhavam Yuge Yuge. They, they especially mentioned it that Pritranaya Shadhunam, Binashaya Chatuskrita. If you have to, if you have to protect the truth or the good, you have to remove the bad. There is no other way. Okay. After that, I, I want the, the last of the that, uh, slok is that Dharma uh, Sansthapana Artha Shambhavam Yuge Yuge. It means that I am in every place. Bhagavan says, I am in every place. But what our belief is, our Hindu brother's belief is that I am in every place. I want Mr. Daki Nayak to explain this. Our, uh, this belief of uh, we are having is correct or not? Thank you. Our request again from the audience and the volunteers, we prefer questions from non-Muslims so that let's clarify their misconception and then come to the Muslims. They may be attending several programs as such. I normally prefer giving a chance to the non-Muslim. They may not be having this chance regularly to ask any question on Islam. The brother has posed a question before that. He made a comment that there was a fish on the net and he saw that one proof was authentic and the original Osama bin Laden was false. Again, this fish could also be fishy. <laughs> so I'm not going to be one-sided. Ah, that proof you got is correct. Even that could be cooked up by somebody who's enemy of America. So I don't believe on that fish also. So see, I have to be neutral. I cannot be biased and start judging saying, ah, brother, you are right. You know the proof they gave. Well, that also could have been cooked up. That's what we have in Telka, you know, Telka. Tell the audio cassettes and video cassettes. So all this is a gimmick of media. See, I am a man of the media. We know if we want, we can change. Very easy. To change something on the media is very easy. I can make you say what you have not said also. That's a field. So it's very easy. So let's keep the media aside. Again, that also I don't agree what is right or wrong. Allah alam. There's no proof at all. Now coming to your question. What the brother quoted is the shlok from Bhagavad Gita chapter number 4. What the brother quoted, he didn't give the quotation. It's from Bhagavad chapter number 4. That whenever there's adharm, there is untruth, there is violence, there is anarchy in the world. Almighty God, He comes and He takes the form of avatar and He sees to it that this, whatever anarchy, whatever trouble, whatever chaos is there in the world, He comes to finish that thing by taking the form of avatar. Is it right? Do we agree? The difference what we say as Muslims, what we Muslims say that Almighty God, He sends His messenger. Whenever people deviate, from the truth, he keeps on sending messengers as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 7. Wali kulli in had, and to every nation have we sent a messenger, a guide. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatih, chapter 35, verse number 24, There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner or a guide. What we say that Almighty God sent messengers like Adam, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. All of them were messengers of Almighty God. The Hindus believe in the avatar, Almighty God, He takes forms. We say messengers, they say Almighty God takes forms. That's the difference. The difference is they say Almighty God comes down Himself in taking form, which we disagree, which Christianity disagrees, Islam disagrees. What we agree is somewhat similar, though it's a difference of chalk and cheese, but what we say Almighty God sends messengers. These are chosen people of Almighty God to guide the people to the truth. And the last and final messenger that came on the face of the earth was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And Allah has sent several revelations. Several revelations by name four are mentioned. If you have something like the Old Testament, something like the New Testament, we Muslims say this is the last testament. This is the last testament of Almighty God. Good evening, sir. My name is Raj Kumar. I'm doing my final MBBS in Stanley Medical College. Uh, my question is, why do Muslims in India constantly oppose a common civil procedure code? Why do mis Muslims in India 
oppose a common civil procedure code. Thank you, sir. Your brother has asked a very good question that why do Muslims oppose the common civil code? Brother, I am for the common civil code. But that common civil code should be the best code which practically gets result. I am for it. Even if the full Muslims of India are against it, I, Dr. Zakir Naik, is for it and I would debate, I would be on the platform to discuss logically which is the best code, which is the best law. And you find this, that the law which is the most practical law, you implement that. I would advocate that let India have a common civil code. Common criminal code also, why only civil code? have common civil code, common criminal code, but we should have a dialogue that which is the best code. Like a Hindu lady who asked me that why does Islam allow a man to have more than one wife? I gave the answer. People appreciated it. So if you agree with the answer, you'll have to have a common civil code that man is allowed to have more than one wife. There is no other answer for the surplus number of women in the world. There is no other solution. No religion has that solution, though all the religions, there is no religion will say that marry only one, except for the Quran. And I gave an analogy that for hijab, for rape, I give the analogy that the best punishment that you can give, the best punishment you can give, which has the best result, as Islam says, the woman should be dressed up in hijab. The man, whenever he looks at a woman, he should lower his gaze. And after that, if any man rapes a woman, he gets capital punishment, there's death penalty. And I gave the stats of America that according to the FBI report in 1990, 1,756 cases of rape took place every day in the year 1990. In 1996, according to the statistics of US Department of Justice, 2,713 cases of rape took place every day in the year 1996. That means every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place. You know, we are here since the past two hours. More than 200 rapes have taken place in USA from the time we are here. I say that if you implement the Islamic Sharia, that every man when he looks at a woman, he should lower his gaze. Every woman should wear the Islamic hijab, complete body covered except the face and hands up to the wrist. After that, if any man rapes, he gets capital punishment. I am asking you the question, will the rate of rape increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease the practical law and this you can see, there was a program on BBC talking about a part of Nigeria which implemented the Islamic Sharia and they gave the death penalty for rape and immediately the cases of rape came down. The least rate of rape in any part of the world is in Saudi Arabia. I am not speaking in favor of Saudi Arabia. But what is right we have to appreciate. And I congratulate LK Advani. I remember a couple of years back in the 1999, in the month of October, he gave a statement being the Home Minister, that death rap should be given to the rapist. And I congratulate him. He is coming closer to Islam. Maybe the next Home Minister will say that all the women should wear hijab. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. I am, my name is Yashar Payami. I am from Iran, really. And I want to know exactly is that you must have read Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses. And as a Muslim, I, nobody would have liked that book. But, so what do you think Imam Khomeini did was, what he did was correct asking for the people for fatwa. That was my main point. What Imam Khomeini had told about the fatwa, that, uh, against, fatwa against Salman Rushdie, was it correct or what? But that was the question that what Imam Khomeini said regarding the fatwa of Salman Rushdie, is it right or wrong? My basic question is, that why did Imam Khomeini give the fatwa one year later? The first country to ban the book of Salman Rushdie's satanic verses was India. And I congratulated Rajiv Gandhi for doing that act. Why should Khomeini give the fatwa of killing Salman Rajdi after one year? Because he was getting out of the news. All politicians, politicians, if he wanted to give the fatwa, he should have given. The book was reviewed by so many parts of the world, so many countries banned it, and then he gives the fatwa, he should be killed. Whether right or wrong is afterwards, all the political gains, all political gains. All these things are political gains. But what Rajiv Gandhi did, maybe he didn't know about it. And I've given a talk on this issue of satanic verses. Though this book is banned in India, I've read that book. You know, Salman Rajdi, who claims that for namesake he's a Muslim, 
he did not leave anyone. In his book, he even abuses Queen Elizabeth. And the same British government who had banned an American author for using a four-letter word, Father, Uncle, Cousin, King, for the policy of Margaret Thatcher, that same Salman Rushdie, he makes it active and uses ing. And yet the book is very popular. So one American author, they banned because he uses a four-letter word for Margaret Thatcher. This another person, Salman Rushdie, makes it active, ing, for the same Margaret Thatcher's policy, but he gets an award. Why? Because he's maligning Islam, so they're very happy. And do you know, he even did not leave Ram and Sita. You know, these people are respected by the majority of the Indians. He even abused them. I don't want to use that word. He abused them also, he don't leave them. And many of the people are supporting. So maybe Rajiv Gandhi didn't know. But later on, if you read that book, you realize he did not leave anyone. So if a person who keeps on maligning, etc., Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, Verse number 33. As to anyone who wages a war against Allah and his messenger, there are various options given, that you can either execute him, you can crucify him, chop off opposite limbs, or take him out of the country. And this law is not only in the Quran, it is even in the Bible. If you read the book of Leviticus, it says that anyone who blasphemes the law, you should stone that person to death. Even a passerby who is a stranger should stone that person to death who blasphemes the law. So this law is then all the religious scripture not only there in Islam, in most of the religious scripture for blasphemy, whether it be Christianity, whether it be Islam, whether it be Judaism, for blasphemy, if it's a confirmed blasphemy, if it's that part of the country. We cannot give fatwas here, they should kill him, etc. If it's an Islamic state of law, if anyone blasphemeth, there are certain laws and rules and regulations laid down. But what politicians do, whether it be a Muslim politician or whether it be a non-Muslim politician, I'm sorry, I don't again want to hurt any politicians per se. If not all, I say majority. You find somewhere or the other they compromise for their own World Bank. And that's the reason that it is said that religion and politics that you pose apart. They use religion as a plank to see to it that they get fame, etc. And that's what people do, which we people should be aware that the fatwa given by Khomeini, it was just a political gimmick according to me. But banning the book, what Rajiv Gandhi did, was perfect. He banned it, he was the first. And now they're thinking of removing the ban. I don't know whether the ban has come out or not. There's another statement that they're trying to remove the ban. But if anyone blasphemed the Lord in Islam, in Christianity, that person according to Christianity should be stoned to death. In Islam, there are four options. You can even exile him. Christianity, no option. Christianity, only stoning to death. In Islam, there are four options you can choose. In Christianity, you have to stone that person to death. Hope that answers the question. Good evening, sir. I'm T.A. Anuragni. I'm a final law student. The, I believe that terrorism could be stopped by, uh, at least could be reduced, when people are taught about tolerance. Does Islam preach about tolerance? And if, if it does, do people who are in charge of imparting Islam, I mean, uh, I believe uh, there are a lot of, uh, I don't know the exact term, terminology, there are uh, gurus like in Hinduism, who teach Islam to the other uh, um, Muslims. So in that case, do they, do they impart, uh, preach tolerism? The sister asked a good question, and she rightly says that terrorism can be curbed by teaching tolerance, and does Islam teach tolerism? Do the religious leaders of Islam, do they teach tolerism? Sister, I said in my talk, which I said a bit fast, I didn't pay emphasis on it, one of the criteria for any human being to go to Jannah, to go to heaven, to go to paradise, is tolerance. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, Wal-Asr, inna l-insana fi khusr, illa lazina amnu, wa amilu salihati, wa tawasaw bil haqqa, wa tawasaw bil sabr. By the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deed, those who exhort people to truth, that is to dawa, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. Tolerance is one of the criteria to go to Jannah. If you are not tolerant, according to Surah Al-Asr, you shall not go to Jannah. Not only should you be tolerant, you should even exhort people towards tolerance. But tolerance by definition, it has got various meanings. And if you ask experts, that tolerance also has a limit. 
What do you mean by tolerance? Fine, someone does something wrong to you, you do not retaliate, it's good. Till how long? So tolerance also has a limit. And in Islam, Zalim is a person who does Zulm. Means, you could say that a person who causes harm. There are two types of Zulm. One is a person who does harm to the others and another is a person who does harm to himself. There are two types of Zalim and both are referred as Zalim. One who does Zulm on others and another type who does Zulm on himself. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, it's mentioned in the Hadith of Sahih Muslim. If you see anything which is wrong going on, if you can, you should stop it with your hand. If you cannot stop it with your hand, stop it with your mouth, with your tongue. If you cannot stop it with the tongue, at least curse in your heart that the act is wrong. And if you do that, you are the lowest level of believer. The lowest level. So what we have to do, that we have to be tolerant, teach tolerance, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 153, Inna Allah ma that verily, Allah is with those who do sabr. But while doing sabr, we should see to it that does not go beyond limit. Sabr also has a limitation. Tolerance has a limitation. So before it goes over limit, if you see that a woman is being raped, you can't tell the woman, tolerate it, no problem. If God has given me strength, if I see a man raping a woman, I should stop it with my hand. If I cannot do it with my hand, it is a by saab, please don't rape. In Bombay, an article, a young girl, 13 years girl, she was raped by a man and there were five passengers. Only one person objected and he was kept quiet. Five people could have by that man who was drunkard, who was drunk and they did not do anything. What's happened to the humanity? What has happened to humanity? Five young people cannot take care of one drunkard raping a girl in a train. Will you call this tolerance? I would call it cowardice. Therefore I say that if these five people were terrorists, terrorists in the sense terrorizing the antisocial element, that person would have the guts to do it. So what sister we have to encourage and see to it that tolerance level of every human being is increased. At the same time, they should not become cowards. They should see to it that the antisocial element in the society, they are reduced. And we should collectively gather together and see to it that these people who are anti-social people, they are brought to task. Hope that answers the question. Hello, my name is B. D. Pak. I am a chartered accountant. I would like to ask a question to you, sir, regarding the, the erstwhile Taliban regime issued a fatwa for the destruction of Bami and Buddhas, terming it as un-Islamic. I would like to know whether it is really un-Islamic and if it is one of the footsteps which the Satan has laid and uh, the Muslims should be aware of. Brother asked me the question, the same question was asked to me in Surat when I was giving a lecture talk in Surat. Just a couple of days after this issue, it was very hot in the oven. The Taliban that were destroying rather at that time the statue of Buddha Bamiyan. The brother asked me the question that is it Islamic etc. And the same question asked by a non-Muslim to me in Surat. That is it right or is it wrong? At that time yet there were conflicting views whether they were destroying or not. So again I said at that time that I don't know whether they destroyed or not. But today we know there are confirmed news that they have destroyed it. Whether right or wrong. What I can say, what I can say that I being a student of comparative religion, whether right or wrong I'll tell afterwards. What I can tell that surely the Taliban's, if they destroyed the statue of Buddha, what they were doing is actually they were educating the Buddhists. I am a student of comparative religion. I have read the Buddhist scriptures. I have read Dhammapad. I have read the scriptures. No way in any of the Buddhist scriptures did Buddha ever say make a statue of myself. Buddha never said that the Buddha should do idol worship. It is a later innovation. So what I could say as a student of comparative religion, whether right or wrong will come afterwards, what they were doing is surely they were educating the Buddhists. And in none of the Buddhist scripture is it mentioned that they should make a statue. Coming to the question. And this question was asked to me even by the press when I was in Bangalore. That just because Islam feels idol worship is not allowed, there are other religions, there is even Christianity. If you read 
the Old Testament. It's mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 and 9. As well as the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5. It says, Thou shalt have no other image besides me. Thou shalt not make any graven image of me, of any likeness of anything in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, on the water above the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. So even according to Christianity, according to Judaism, making images of anyone who you say is God is prohibited. Same it is prohibited in Islam. So when I gave this reply that they were educating the Buddhists, so what they said, that but didn't these Talibans, didn't they cause grief to millions of Buddhists? I said yes. So does Islam allow anyone to cause grief to millions of human beings? I asked the journalist a question. That what if suppose the Indian government catches a haul of drugs, cocaine, brown sugar worth 10 crore rupees. Worth about 2 million dollars they catch a haul. Drugs. What will the Indian government do? So the journalist told me the Indian government will burn the drugs. I said good. I said do you know for millions of human beings in the world drug is God for them. So will you agree with the Indian government or go against the government that they are destroying the god of millions of drug addicts? Because the Indian government feels that the drug will cause loss to the body, what they are doing is right even though it is causing grief to millions of drug addicts. But if they feel it is wrong, they are burning. You cannot go and tell the Indian government that why are you burning the drugs? A drug addict will feel bad. So similarly, Afghanistan is their government. It is their property. See, the statue is their property. If they come and do something in any other country, then you can object. They are doing in their country, it is their property. If they like it, they'll keep it. If they want to destroy it, they'll destroy it. Who are we to object? We can't object. And furthermore, if you analyze that people who talk, there are the person who said that Indian government is so tolerant. Do you know in Bombay, when you come out of the domestic airport, of the Santa Cruz airport, there was a big statue of Mahavi, of Mahavi. Just outside the hotel jail, and it was unclothed, so the people took objection, and then they built a wall in front of the private parts. Later on, after a few months, they removed the statue. Now those same people who objected to the statue being there, those same people today are condemning Afghanistan. Why? The same people who objected to the statue being on the road. See, and do you know there are more Jains in India than Buddhists in Afghanistan? So when the government of Bombay could remove the statue which is believed to be God or believed to be the Tirthankas of the Jains and there are more Jains living in India than Buddhists living in Afghanistan, at that time no one objected. And now when the Afghanistan government is doing your objecting, why these double policies? You know why? Because of the World Bank. <laughs> Won't the Jain feel bad? So if the Jain believes in keeping a statue of Mahavir, who is a Tritanka, why are we objecting? At that time, everyone objected, the statue should be removed, statue should be removed. And the same people who objected are condemning that why did you destroy the Bamiyan Buddha statue? Double policies. Therefore, we as logical people should have a single policy. We should not be two-faced jammed in where we keep on changing the rules. So what I feel that it is their property, suppose, suppose a non-Muslim, he buys a house. In the house, there is a carving of Kaaba. Suppose, if there is there. If that non-Muslim does not like Kaaba and he defaces the Kaaba, how can I object? If someone, you know, and believe me, if, if any Muslim, if any Muslim, if he makes a statue of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and if you disturb the statue, even if the full Muslim world is against you, I, Dr. Zakir Naik, will support you. Because making a statue of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is prohibited. If any Muslim lunatic, makes the statue of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he worships it. And if you, being a non-Muslim, knowing knowledge of Islam, if you go and destroy the statue, even if the full Muslim world is against you, I, Dr. Zakir Naik, will support you. Uh, Mr. Jagir Naik, uh, what does uh, Islam say about the defaming of the other religion or other religious gods? Why I am asking this question is that uh, when uh, one of the Indian artists who is uh, a Muslim, he has drawn a Hindu god Saraswati in a nude condition, which was appreciated by everybody as a freedom of expression. And each and every Indian supported when 
Salman Rushdie has written one book about the Islam and when it was banned by Raji Gandhi, almost each and every Indian has supported that move. But when Hussein has drawn the Hindu God in a nude condition, Indian political parties, especially the parties like a communist, have told that uh, it is a freedom of expression, he can draw anything. But uh, what is the Islam's view on that, about the defaming the gods of the other religion? The brother is referring to the Muslim artist F.M. Hussein. He didn't give the name or maybe he doesn't know, maybe he knows he didn't want to give the name. F.M. Hussein, he's from Bombay, from the city where I come. He did some paintings of God Saraswati, unclothed and many of the journalists support it saying it's freedom of expression. You ask my opinion, first of all making a nude picture of any lady whether God or not God is haram in Islam. Whether Muslim or non-Muslim. It is unethical, inhuman. Why do you want to sell your daughters? Why are you going back? See what's happening in the Western cultures. They are selling our sisters, selling our mothers and one of the famous ads which I heard about BMW. You know BMW car? You know about the BMW car? It is somewhat like Mercedes for the youngsters. Mercedes, top level car. In that ad, I am sorry to say, I was told that there is a lady standing in the bikini in front of that car and it's mentioned there, test drive her now. Who, the car or the girl? <laughs> what has the girl got to do with the car? So this is all in name of freedom of expression that you're the woman. What F.M. Hussain did is totally wrong. Regarding a basic question, can you criticize the other gods of other religion? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, revile not those, abuse not those who they worship God besides Allah, lest in their ignorance they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran says, abuse not those gods who the people worship besides Allah lest in the ignorance they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in Islam, it is prohibited to abuse anyone else is God, even though you may not agree is God. It's prohibited. That's what the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse 108. And what F.M. Hussein did during the nude painting is totally prohibited in Islam. Hope that's the question. Pakhru Dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. It's my extreme privilege to thank the Consul General of the U.S. Consulate of Chennai, Dr. Richard D. Haynes, Mr. Krishnachand Chorodia, Dr. M. S. Ambaresan, and Dr. Zakir Naik and his team, and all the volunteers and co-organizers of the program. Wa akhirat da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.